Last time we did talk about the biblical approach, theological approach to the scriptures. That is what the big picture is. It's a biblical theological approach to the Bible. We're going to see how it unfolds progressively from beginning to end in a comprehensive manner. And then that comprehensive manner, we approach it with the proper hermeneutic that holds the Bible together as one divine book, one divine revelation that has consistency, coherency, and congruency. That's very important as we see who God is and what He's doing. And so we we talked about the relationship between systematic theology and then biblical theology. And today, we're going to dive into systematic theology to help us define this great triune God that we have and then the relationship within the Trinity between the Father and Son. So we're going to draw on some good uh, systematic theology to set this forth for you. Because really, we, we, we see this doctrine from the Scriptures and glean it from the Scriptures and we put it together to understand who our God is. But what I want you to see today is that ultimately it's this relationship that is the foundation for the plan of God from beginning to end. Okay, It's foundational to what God is doing. Uh, in everything he's doing. Okay, so that's what I have in that little bullet point. We're going to talk about the Trinitarian relationships within the Godhead, especially the Father-Son. And in that we find the basis or the foundation, again, for God's unfolding plan that is designed from beginning to end. And I'm going to argue for this, to set the Son, the second person of the Godhead, on display for the glory of God's name. Okay, that's what I want to encourage you to embrace, but not because I'm saying it, but because I think it's very, very biblical. So let's begin. First, we're going to talk about the Trinity. And uh, we, you know, we have a course in our Bible Institute on the Trinity. It's going to be taught soon by uh, uh, Brian Rutland. But this is just some summary ideas to refresh your memory about our incomprehensible God. And this is beyond our ability to get our arms around, really, the Trinity. Uh, Wayne Grudem, in his systematic theology, defines the doctrine of the Trinity like this. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God, and there is one God. (laughs) <laughs> wow. The divine being. There's only one divine being, and this is who he is. James White defines the Trinity in his book, The Forgotten Trinity. He says it this way. Within the one being that is God, one God, one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we can kind of sum up the definition then with these three statements. God is three persons, okay? Father, Son, and Spirit. Each person is fully God. Three eternally existing, co-equal, and co-eternal persons. And there is one God. There is one being that is God. Not three, one. Three persons. Now, isn't that unbelievable? We can't understand that, but that's the way it is. On page two, you have a a neat little diagram. That's why there's some space at the end of page one. I couldn't fit fit it at the bottom. Um, From one of the uh, theologies, might have been uh, Wayne Grudem's. But you see, you see the Trinity, and notice, every person is God. Every person has the full essence of, of the character, the nature of God. Every person is God. But every person is not equal to the other person. Okay? And, and that's amazing. And, and this is what's so wonderful about it. And this is very mysterious. Because a person has a personality, right? Every person in here has a personality. 
And every person in the Godhead has a unique personality. Uh, that is reflected in the way God reveals Himself to, in, and through the creation. We, we see the divine persons and we begin to understand how they're different in their personalities by how they reveal themselves to us as they interact with the creation. Okay, as God's plan and purpose unfolds. Therefore, the creation and God's interaction with it in history helps us to understand God. And this is important, because God cannot change and has forever been the triune God. He has always existed this way, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the way that the persons of the Trinity relate to the creation and reveal themselves to the creation is how they have forever related to one another in eternity past and will continue to do so in eternity future. Is that making sense to you? They have to be who they are as distinct persons, and they always have been this way, and they will always be this way. Okay? And uh, as Revelation progresses, then, we see some things, and we've summarized them here under Father, Son, and Spirit, and this is just a cursory summary. But the Father then, the supreme member of the Godhead, the role of commanding, directing, and sending, that's important. Sending is how He relates to the Son and the Spirit. And and we would say that's that's appropriate to the position of the Father, after whom all human fatherhood is patterned. And, And we glean this as you see God set on display and we begin to see the persons of the Trinity uh, revealed to us. He is the supreme head within the Godhead. Okay. But doesn't mean the other persons are any la- lacking any in the divine essence. It's just the way the Trinity functions as the persons interact with one another and with the creation. How about the Son? The role of obeying Going, we'll have some verses later about this. Obeying, going as the Father sends, and revealing God to us in His redeeming and ruling work is appropriate to the role of the Son, who is also called the eternal Word of God. And you you can see that. In I give you some verses there. John chapter one is significant with regard to his relationship with the Father and who he is. Um, John 10, 36, uh, do you say, Jesus said to the Pharisees, do you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? John 17, 4, I glorified you on the earth, Jesus prays, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. See, there's an authority structure within the Trinity. And the Father sends the Son. You can see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You know, the great humility of the Son who does not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but in obedience to the Father, empties Himself, takes the form of a body, is crucified to accomplish the Father's good, good pleasure. Okay? Um, We'll talk more about this as we move along. Beautiful personality of God the Son. The Spirit, the role of going again as the Father and Son both send the Spirit to accomplish the will of God. So now we have this order taking place. The Father has the authority to send the Son and the Spirit, but the Son also has the authority to send the Spirit. So we have the first and second and third person in the Godhead and how they function. Is that making sense? Okay. And not one person is clamoring to be the other person. Isn't that amazing? The Spirit's not going, how come I'm not more set on display and more important? No. It's God that's being exalted and glorified. It's marvelous, the beauty of our triune God. And we also see in a couple of other texts, 
that the Spirit's primary role is to point to Jesus Christ, to point to the Son. John 15, 26, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And John 16, 13 and 14, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. You see that? That's why the focus in some of the charismatic camps on the Spirit is so unbiblical. Because the Spirit's not about himself. He's about Christ. Exalting Christ. Setting Christ. And that's what the Father's going to do. We're going to see that. That's what the Father does. Okay. These roles could not have been reversed or the Father would have ceased to be the Father and the Son would have ceased to be the Son, the Father could not have been sent by the Son to die for the sins of men. Does that make sense? Okay. It's the way our God is. And then a couple concluding little remarks. In a family, like we have, our families, fathers and sons relate the way God intended. In a family where they relate the way God intended, we have an example of how the Father and the Son relate in the Trinity. The Father directs and has authority over the Son. And the Son obeys out of love for the Father and is responsive to the directions of the Father. Wow. Therefore, while the persons of the Trinity are equal in all their attributes or essence, they differ in how they each relate to the creation and to one another. The the Son and the Holy Spirit are equal in deity to God the Father, but they are subordinate in their roles. Okay? Unbelievable. Moreover, page three, see, we're zipping through this. (laughs) But you know me. I'm going to, you know, find some kind of rabbit trail to make my wife do exactly that. Keep going, Greg, keep going. She She rotates her finger around her ear to tell me to keep on track. Okay. Moreover, these differences in role are not temporary, but will last forever. And, and, and the Son's personality and role doesn't start at the Incarnation. He's always been that way from eternity past. That's His personality. Okay? Marvelous. Okay, <clears throat> so let's begin to talk then a little bit about the Father-Son relationship. Again, we're... We're gleaning these things from Scripture. And probably without even looking at some of these things, as you've read your Bibles, you would see that the primary Trinitarian relationship that is focused on in the Scriptures is not the Father and the Spirit, the Son and the Spirit, but it's the Father and the Son. Is that fair? As you read your Bibles, it's, it's the focus is on the Father and the Son. And I think that is fair. Okay. Um, as the scriptures unfold, there is a clear, clear revelation of the beautiful relationship that has ever existed within the Trinity between the Father and His Son. This is, of course, especially seen uh, as God the Son takes to Himself a human nature. Before time, He's God the Son. But in time, as the plan works out, he enters into history. He takes to himself of human nature as the son of David to fulfill all Old Testament promise and prophecy, functioning in history to reveal God to us as both the lion from the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, And those, we're going to see that those two roles as lion and lamb are absolutely significant to understanding the big picture of the Bible and God's plan to exalt His Son. Okay, And next next week, when we start diving into Genesis, we're going to start to unfold this. I have a chart for you next week. (laughs) Not this week. A chart that I won't say it. Suitable for framing framing and putting on your den wall. (laughs) 
but not today, next week, okay? And, and we're going to see and we're going to make an argument for the reality that those two roles of lion and lamb are seen and meant to be seen from beginning to the end and on into eternity to show God to us in the face of Christ. So, this relationship is succinctly summed up, I think, in Matthew 3. There's two places in the New Testament. But first one is Matthew 3, 16 and 17. After being baptized, you know, he's identifying with the ministry of John the Baptist. He's humbly ready to begin this uh, ministry as he will end up dying for the sins of men. Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and <coughs> lighting on him, John did, John the Baptist. <laughs> and behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay? And not only that, but then also in Matthew 17, 5. So here, here is the humble beginning of the suffering servant. This is my beloved Son, who's going to function as the Lamb, in whom I'm well pleased. But then it says it again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the veil is removed and the glorious manifestation of the King of glory is seen. Same thing. While He was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Everything about him pleases God the Father in everything he does and how he fulfills everything God has purposed to show us God through this person. Pleases God. Isn't that neat? And guess what? You are acceptable to God only in him. He is the, the Son who pleases the Father like no one else ever can or will. But He accepts you in Him and loves you in Him. When He enters into history, the Eternal Son manifests uh, the personality of the second person of the Godhead. Okay, He manifests that personality. He sweetly submits to do the will of the Father out of love for the Father. And people, what's amazing about this is He is our example of what it means to walk with God as a human being. Right? This is what should be reflected in us as we are conformed into His image, that sweet, submissive spirit to the will of God. As we go about living and doing and serving and suffering, and whatever God takes you through, this is to be the attitude, right? Sweetly submit. This is how He's always been, though. This is His personality in the Godhead. Wow. He didn't become this, but the plan is going to reflect this, that which has been true from eternity past. You kind of getting that? When he enters into history, the eternal Son manifests the personality of the second person of the Godhead, submitting to God, John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Wow. Was it easy? An easy path to walk? No. But he also said, my... Yoke is easy, my burden is light. Why? Because what motivated him? Love for the Father. Wow. Hebrews 10, 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And uh, John four thirty four. Jesus said to them, My food, what sustains me is to do the will of Him who sent me. He sent me. And to accomplish His work. Isn't that great? And I love this one, because this is 
We're, he's leaving the upper room here, Jesus. You know, he's going to the cross hours away. And I like this because I think this is the primary motive in Jesus' heart for going to the cross. And I'm not minimizing his love for you or me. He, he went to do that out of love for us, but here is the primary reason. John 14, 31. But so that the world may know <clears throat> that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. We're going to go to the cross. Why? Because I love the Father. Uh, first and foremost, it's the glory of the Father that drives him. It's love for the Father that drives him. Now, it, it doesn't mean he doesn't love his people that he's dying for, but this is the primary motive, okay? I think that's fair. And it goes way back before time. It's anchored in the Trinitarian relationship. You, you hanging in there with me? This love relationship then that we were kind of just touch, scratching the surface, between Father and Son that existed before time and is manifested in time, obviously, and recorded in the Scriptures, is the foundation of God's plan and purpose revealed to us in the Scriptures. Th see, people, before we even look at Genesis 1-1, you've got to get this. Because there's a lot of ways to look at the Bible. And there's a lot of purposes that men set forth as the main idea of the Bible. But we're going right back to this relationship and saying, this relationship is the foundation of the plan. Okay? I want you to get that. This is what drives God to do what He does. It flows out of this relationship. And, I, and we can prove that, that, I think. The preeminence of God the Son in this plan is confirmed by some very significant text. The first one is my favorite verse in the Bible. <laughs> so if you know me, you know that's true. In fact, uh, not only this, but a couple of verses before and a number of verses after, I have memorized and I repeat them to my heart all the time. And they help me through the day to keep the perspective on what God's doing. And my little life is part of it. But here's what is God is all about, in a sense. And it drives me. And it should drive you. The preeminence of God the Son. Paul in Colossians, he just can't help himself. He just Right before this, he says, The Father, He uh, rescued us from the domain of darkness and delivered us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then he just goes, let me tell you about Him. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, the preeminent person of all creation. Why? For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, and here it is, people, all things have been created through Him, and what? For Him. For His glory unto the glory of God. Wow. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. That text, remember, it was one of the maxims we have concerning uh, the study of the Bible. The Bible's a human book, the Bible's a divine book, and the Bible is about Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. John 5. Remember, he's interacting with the Pharisees. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Why? Because for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings... How will you believe my words? They miss the point of the whole Old Testament bringing us, pointing us to a beautiful person. A couple more texts. And we'll, we'll mention some more as we go along. These aren't the only ones that confirm this. 
Uh, Luke 24, 25, and 27. And let me just say this, in a sense. This is kind of my desire for this class. <laughs> I wish I'd have been there with Cleopas and his buddy. But anyway, on the road to Emmaus, you remember the road to Emmaus, right? Resurrection. They don't know what's going on. They, they're confused. The one they thought was going to deliver Israel had been crucified by the Romans. What's going on? And Jesus comes and walks with them, and He says to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all, that's a key term, all that the prophets have spoken. They understood the kingdom. The glorious consummated kingdom was going to come under Messiah one day. They got that. That's what was discouraging them. If he's the Messiah, how could he be put to death by the Romans? Because the promises in the Old Testament say a glorious kingdom is going to come with Messiah coming. But they didn't get all the Scriptures had prophesied. And here's what he says. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things, this, this horrendous death, and then enter into His glory, bringing with the glorious kingdom. They didn't get Isaiah 53. That was the problem. They didn't understand the suffering servant Messiah. They didn't get that the cross had to come before the crown. But it wasn't that the old. they were wrong about certain things about the Old Testament. They got it. Then, beginning with Moses, Genesis through... The Pentateuch, first five books. And with all the prophets, that it kind of sums up the Bible. He explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. How many hours do you think they had together? You think they had like a three year class? No. So is Jesus hitting the high points in this explanation to them? Yes. And and I think, not to be silly about it, But that's what we're going to do in this class. We're going to hit the high points of God's plan and purpose that point us to Jesus Christ. I think some of the things we're going to talk about, He talked about. Is that fair? I think it's fair. So that's my desire for this class. It's kind of like, let's walk on the road to Emmaus with Christ and and see these things by the grace of God in the Bible. Okay, one more. Luke 24, 44 to 45. Now he said, this is right, same chapter of Luke. You know, he appears to them again, to all of them. Because these guys go running back to Jerusalem. We've seen the risen Christ. What? Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms, that's the way to sum up the entire Old Testament. Must be fulfilled. Written about me, must be fulfilled. And then He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Boy, that's what we need, isn't it? By the grace of God, to see these things, to understand. So, I think that helps prove the point that when we start to look at the Bible... It's about the Son of God that the Father is going to set on display as everything unfolds. Is that fair? Chris did this. <laughs> okay. Again, the plan and its outworking reflect, reflect in creation and history and forever, really, the functional relationships that have eternally existed within the Godhead between the three persons. And I'm going to give you a couple summary points Um, that I'm sure the people I teach on Thursday nights are tired of hearing, but doesn't matter. Here it is again. It's a summation of John Piper below, okay? And we're going to look at some of John Piper's thoughts, but this is not coming from me. I have learned so much from John Piper because his focus is theologically, I think he nails this with regard to that relationship between father and son. (laughs) and a focus on Jesus Christ. So here we go. Let me just sum it up here. And then we'll, we'll, for the rest of our time, we'll kind of look at some of Piper's thoughts. 
and uh, bring things to a close. But anyway, God the Son, okay, has eternally been the delight of the Father's heart. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That didn't begin at the Incarnation. As He, the Son, has perfectly, infinitely, and beautifully reflected back to the Father the essence of the divine being. He has seen His beauty eternally reflected back to Him in the face of His Son. God, first and foremost, loves and delights in His Son. And here we go, because God delights most in most, hear this, God delights most in the infinite beauty of his own nature, not me and you. You need to understand that. The plan that is put in place is unfolding for the glory of God's name. And God is about setting his name on display. Now, our salvation is part of that, right? It's part of it. But it's not the be-all, end-all of everything. The be-all, end-all of everything is God's glory as He exalts His name. The beauty of His own nature is what God infinitely delights in. And, and Piper makes this point. You'll read it when you get the chance to read through the, this section. Uh, this must be so. See if you follow the logic. Or God would be an idolater Himself delighting in something less than what is supremely worthy of infinite delight, God Himself. Does that make sense? That has to be true. It can't be about me and you first and foremost. It has, this is why the Trinity is so magnificent. God never had to create to delight in something or someone else. He's always been self-contained in His joy and delight within those Trinitarian relationships as He has been infinitely satisfied in delighting in what's most beautiful, and that is the glory of His own essence. And He sees that forever reflected to Him in the face of Jesus, in the face of His Son. Is that, isn't that great? I like that. I like that. That means God is happy, isn't He? Isn't He happy? Can anything diminish that joy of His delight in His Son and the infinite? No. Including my wretched stupidity and foolishness. He, he you know, we can grieve the Spirit and all, but you cannot diminish that ever. He's ha- and I'm happy that He is so happy. Aren't you happy with people that are happy? Be happy because God is infinitely joy in the delight of His own Son. That's great. Given this infinitely glorious relationship between the Father and the Son, a relationship in which the Holy Spirit also participates with infinite delight because the Son's essence is His as well, right? As He promotes it, it's, He's promoting the beauty of His own essence, in a sense. We can conclude... Let's hope we can conclude. I want to see a bunch of nodding heads. We can conclude, I'm just kidding, uh, that the primary reason for the focus on the Son in the creative purpose of the triune God is because of the Father's eternal delight in His Son. Right? Does that make sense? Doesn't it make sense that if that's true from eternity past, that when He puts the plan in place, He's going to set Him on display? I think so. Therefore, the Father has decreed a plan. An eternal, define, decree, the eternal decree that sets Jesus Christ on display as the one in whom, through whom, and for whom all things have been made. Okay? And this plan, get this, brings the most joy to the Father's own heart as He beholds, delights in, and loves with infinite joy His beloved Son in whom He is well pleased for all eternity. Isn't that great? He's always delighted in the beauty of His sons reflecting back. But now the context has changed. He comes into history and lives out those attributes in history and forever. And guess what? The Father's just... Rejoicing in 
those attributes, that beauty being set on display through Jesus to the creation. Uh, that just blows my mind. It's marvelous. It's beautiful. Okay? It should help us to think well about God and what He's doing and why He is doing it, setting His Son on display. And, you know, sometimes when I share that, uh, the objection would come, wait a minute, Greg, the Bible's about the Father's glory. What about that? It seems like you're diminishing that. You know how I would counter that? Philippians 2. Listen to this. This sums it up. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. You know the text. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bonser, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's an Old Testament reference to Yahweh. And though of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't miss the last prepositional phrase. To the glory of God the Father. So when He does this in this plan, when He sets Christ on display in this plan, He's exalting and bringing glory to His own name as the Father. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Isn't this great? Nod some heads. Let me hear an amen. amen. Hey. <laughs> all right, all right. He loves his son forever, and now he sees that set on display. So, that's a summary. Now, let's just spend a few minutes We've, uh, looking at some of John Piper. This comes, what I, I drew some of this excerpt from uh, the book, The Pleasures of God by John Piper. He's got a number of chapters in that book of what God the, delights in. It's kind of his theology proper, his theology of God. And it's very good. It's very worth reading. But the first chapter is God's pleasure in His Son. And man, that as I got my arms around that, it set, helped me put everything together in what we're going to do in this class. Flowing from before time. And so, uh, what He does, I think, is fair. You can read through it. I'm going to hit some of the highlights just because I can't help myself because uh, they're so beautiful. And John Piper writes really well. Sometimes it's harder for me to follow his preaching than his writing. I love the way he writes. Okay? And so, this, the rest of your notes are this excerpt that I gave you guys Thursday night, but I'm including it here for everybody. John Piper on the Father's Delight in the Son. Let's hit some of these. Love, God loves His Son for shining like the sun, S-U-N, the sun. Okay. And you're going to see in the first two elements, first the glory, then the humility of Jesus. But let's take tackle this one first. God's pleasure is first and foremost a pleasure in His Son. The Bible reveals this to us while showing us the face of Jesus shining like the sun in Matthew 17. You remember Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, high mountain, when they're all alone, something utterly astonishing happens. Suddenly, God pulls back the curtain of the incarnation and lets the kingly glory, this marvelous king that was promised, the son of David, who is also united with God the Son, the kingly glory of the Son of God shine through. You remember what that looked like? Can, how, when's the last time you tried to look at the sunshine without your, you know, foster grants? You can't do it. Can't do it. Right? And his face shines brighter than the sun because he created the sun. 
right? His face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. Of course, the three disciples were stunned. Peter mentions it in 2 Peter when he was on the, saw the majestic glory on the holy mountain, heard the voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When God declares openly that he loves and delights in his Son, he gives a visual demonstration of the Son's unimaginable glory. Wow. His face shone like the sun. His garments became translucent with light. Page 5. And the disciples fell on their faces. The point is, he says, Piper says, not merely that humans should stand in awe of such glory, but that God himself takes full pleasure in the radiance of his Son. He reveals him in blinding light and then says, this is my delight, right? That's, you know, remember Hebrews? I'll tell you, this is unbelievable. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, similar Colossians. And get this, and he, the Son, is the radiance of, of His glory. It's like the sun and the sunshine. He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's the lion and the lamb, and He has unimaginable, infinite glory that the Father can take in. You and I will never be able to take that in. Right? You're going to be in heaven a billion moments down the road and the Spirit of God will increase your capacity to see the beauty of God in the face of Christ. And when you've been there a billion moments, you will have seen a drop in the infinite ocean of the glory of God. But the Father can see it with infinite joy. The only one who can see that. Isn't that amazing? Don't you want to be there? Man, just give me a drop. But it starts now, people. It starts now. Right? We behold Him on the pages of this book. That's what we're doing this class for. Who can look upon the sun shining in full strength? The answer is that God can. The radiance of the sun's face shines first and foremost for the enjoyment of His Father. This is the Son whom I love. He is my pleasure. You must fall on your face and turn away. But I behold my Son in His radiance every day with love and never-fading joy. I think that's great. It's still true. It has been true. It's true forever. He loves Him, then the flip side of that, for serving like a dove. You remember the first time He says it is when He's baptized and the dove comes down from heaven. And there's an association here with the ministry of Jesus that's coming where he's going to be the suffering servant, not opening his mouth. God's pleasure in his Son comes not only from the brightness of his majesty, but from the beauty of his meekness. This is so wonderful. The beauty of it. Look at the contrast. Majesty and meekness in this person. The Father delights in His Son's supremacy and in His servanthood. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And then He quotes uh, Isaiah in Matthew 12, 18-20. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the nations. He will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering flax. The Father's very soul exalts with joy over the servant-like meekness and compassion of his Son. Isn't that great? What a beautiful person to fall more in love with. So, his beauty has ma- is majestic and he has meekness. God loves the strength of the Lion of Judah 
That is why he is worthy in God's eyes to open the scrolls. Remember in Revelation? Who can take the scroll out of God's hand to bring about the future end of all things? The lion from the tribe of Judah. But when John looks again at the throne, who does he see? A lamb standing as if slain in the midst. Both are necessary to understand the beauty of Jesus Christ. Jesus is worthy of the Father's delight. Last sentence on page 5. Not only as the Lion of Judah, but also as the slain Lamb. Page 6. This is just for your... This is, was neat. He meant, I included this. But uh, Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, and uh, by the way, Piper gets a lot of his thoughts by reading Jonathan Edwards. It doesn't come originally with him. He sees it all through Jonathan Edwards, who was the greatest American theologian to ever live, really. And he preached a sermon, uh, 1734, 1735, The Excellency of Christ. In it, Edwards unfolds the glory of God's Son by describing what he said, quote, the admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies in Christ. This idea of humility and majesty. The next paragraph, in Jesus Christ, he says, meet infinite highness and infinite condescension, infinite justice and infinite grace, infinite glory and lowest humility, infinite majesty and transcendent meekness, deepest reverence toward God and equality with God worthiness of good, and the greatest patience under the suffering of evil, a great spirit of obedience and supreme dominion over heaven and earth. He, he suffered, but he's the ruler of it. Absolute sovereignty and perfect resignation, self-sufficiency, and an entire trust and reliance on God his Father. Unbelievable. And I think this is a good point. The next paragraph simply makes the point that this, th these qualities of submission and his meekness under the Father's hand didn't start at the Incarnation. This is who he is and has been forever. Does that make sense? Important. Then he talks about infinite intimacy. And I'll let you read most of that. This is the idea of this. He says, no other relationship comes close to this one. It is utterly unique. Jesus is the only begotten Son, the unique Son in the affections of the Father. You and I are adopted sons. He is the only begotten Son. Okay. We're on different playing fields here with regard to God's affections. Uh, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And so we need Jesus to reveal the Father to us. Right, people? He loves him for laying down his life. So the Father seeks every means possible to exalt and set him on display. I think that's fair. Page 7. Kind of rushing a little bit. He, he goes on in the rest of that to talk about how he's more highly exalted than any of the angels, seated at his right hand. Unimaginable fervency. Uh... It's impossible to overstate the greatness of the fatherly affection God has for His one and only Son. Unbounded affection. Uh, if there, second paragraph, and you can read these things that fill it in. If there ever was a passion of love in the heart of God, it is a passion for His Son. Tozer said, God never changes moods or cools off in His affections or loses enthusiasm. If there is any enthusiasm in God of which this is true, it is His enthusiasm for the Son. It will never change. It will never cool off. It burns with unimaginable fervency and zeal. Therefore, I affirm with Jonathan Edwards, the infinite happiness of the Father consists in the enjoyment of His Son. Isn't that great? I think that's great. Then he talks about his, he's well pleased with the Son, his soul delights in the Son. In, the, in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That's unbelievable. Page 8. It, within the Trinity, it just goes on to talk about the reality that unlike Allah, who had to create to have somebody to put his affections on, our God has never been alone. 
because of the triune relationship and his love for his son. And, he, and you can finish reading. He says that this is just, uh, he says we are on the brink of the ineffable here when you start to consider the three persons. Uh, ineffable, I had to look that one up. Too great or extreme to be expressed or de- described in words. Isn't that true? We can't get our arms around this, but it's true. And then finally, God's delight in being God. Let me just read that first paragraph. We're about done. We may conclude that the pleasure of God in His Son is pleasure in Himself, right? That's the point about not being an an idolater. Since the Son is the image of God and the radiance of God and the form of God equal with God and indeed is God, therefore God's delight in the Son is delight in Himself. And he goes on to emphasize that. Seeing the glory of him, his very essence in the face of Christ. Okay? And uh, let me move on to page 9 then, real quick. And, and let me just say this, before we... I, 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 Piper's good with exhortations, but, but this great relationship, dear people, it, it, this is what your salvation is all about. Your salvation is all about one thing. O righteous Father, John 17, 25 and 26, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. Knowing God is exemplified by Jesus' relationship with the Father. And you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. This whole business of your salvation has one purpose, to bring you into and to allow you to enjoy and participate in the love relationship between the Father and the Son. He's sharing it with you. He's giving it to you so you can delight in what's most delightful, and that's the beauty of God's glory seen in the face of Jesus, and He's giving it to you. That's what your salvation's all about. It's not about anything less. It had better be about love for Him right now and forever because that's what your salvation's all about. That's where it's going. Hence, the exhortation by good old John Piper. Let's start with the second paragraph. Let us then stand in awe of this great God and let us turn from all the trivial resentments and fleeting pleasures and petty pursuits of materialism and merely human spirituality, and let us be caught up into the gladness that God has in the glory of His Son, who is the radiance and image of His Father. There is a coming day when the very pleasure that the Father has in the Son will be in us and will be our own pleasure in glory forever. You're going to have sin removed and be as, get as much as you can get as a finite being. Right? Isn't that great? We want that, don't we? Unbounded, everlasting. He says, God's enjoyment, may God's enjoyment of God, unbounded and everlasting, flow into us even now by the Holy Spirit. This is our glory and joy. And then he, here's the problem. You remember Israel's our negative example? <laughs> this is what happened with them in Jeremiah. That millions exchange their glory for what does not profit is an appalling thing. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water, and whatever water is in them is a putrid bunch of junk. There is only one fountain of lasting joy, the overflowing gladness of God in God, without beginning, without ending, without source, without cause, without help or assistance, the spring is eternally self-replenishing. From this unceasing fountain of joy flow all grace and all joy in the universe. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Right, people? Come. And we wanna, I want to show you how this relationship is the foundation of everything God does from the first verse of the Bible when God speaks creation In the beginning, God created. Why? To exalt a person. And we're going to see it. You're going to see it with me together.